But uh, I'm glad you guys are here. My name is Ryan. Uh, as I went around the room, shook hands. I didn't see any other Ryans, but I saw Brian. And so uh, names are important. I'm reminded of that from a dear friend of mine. Uh, he's a mentor, about 30 years older than me. And he said, look, everybody has a name. Everybody is important that is behind that name. Don't forget the value of a person's name and a value of a person. So I'm glad that you're here. I don't think it's by accident that you're here. Um, there is a sovereign plan by a sovereign God who has orchestrated things for you to be able to be here today. And my prayer is, is that honestly you guys would be filled. Um, and as we took to heart the message that we just heard, um, not just about doing but being that what you get out of this message today um, would empower you to be more. Um, I, I want to be more um, than just who I was coming into this building. Um, I actually came with eyes open, ears open, mind open, heart open. That was my prayer this morning. God, uh, help me be open to what it is that you want to say to me um, because I know there are people here today that are so much smarter than me that will help me. And I don't want to be seen as the smartest guy in the room. Anybody like being the smartest one in the room? Mm -hmm. You know? Uh, so I don't want to be the smartest guy in the room, but I want to know people that can help me in my journey through life. Here's a question that I have for you. It's actually behind me on the screen. And, and the question is this, who cares? Legit question. Um, when you think about who cares, I want to ask this question, and I want you to ponder it personally. Other than a family member, so we're going to disregard siblings and parents, mate, uh, children. We're talking about outside the realm of your family. Who has shown care for you? Ponder that for a moment. And I'm going to ask you uh, to participate with me um, because, uh, again, we can learn from one another. Nobody likes to be the first one to speak up. Um, but uh, if we can kind of just break the ice, speak up together, uh, yet yeah, one at a time, uh, I'd like us just to share who maybe has shown some sort of care for you throughout your life that left an impact on you. So I'll be the first one to go because nobody likes to go first, okay? Uh, there was an older gentleman by the name of Claire Carraher. Um, my life is such that uh, I grew up in a home where um, I, I had a father who was not very attentive. Uh, I didn't grow up in a Christian community, by the way. I, I grew up in a very lost pagan community. Some of you um, look at me and you say, well, he doesn't look like the average uh, uh, white Christian that I know. No, I'm sand color. Okay, I'm a little darker than you. Um, I'm actually Jewish, so I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I grew up in a Jewish home. But my dad, um, he grew up on the streets as a kid, um, and then he got married. But he, he would testify of this by way of himself. He was a liar, a thief, a cheat, a degenerate, and at times a drunk. He was a womanizer. He wasn't a good husband, he wasn't a good father. Um, and so I didn't have a loving, nurturing, caring father figure for a number of years of my life. But there was a guy who came into my life uh, much older than me, a grandfather type figure named Claire, who took me under his arm and, and just as a grandfather would, um, just took an interest in me. And, and he took such an interest that um, he taught me um, how to do lapidary work. Any of you know what lapidary is? Cutting of stones, polishing of stones, uh, a, a rock hound. And I was just this punk kid. Claire helped me, loved me, uh, showed me how to do something. And, and uh, it was a short-lived relationship, less than a handful of years. Uh, and then uh, we separated our ways, and I moved to the other side of the country. But I'll never forget he showed care. Some of you, who were some of the people that showed care to you? Brian? Not at work. If you can develop a relationship with folks and listen to their cares and what's going on, whether they work with you as a colleague or an underling, it's about listening. And, and uh, if you show care to them, I believe that then they show care to you. And there's a way that they will recognize that and ask you those kind of 
questions, how are you doing today, but what are you doing this weekend, more about wanting to know what your life's all about. Great. Does somebody come to your mind specifically? That yes. Is, yeah. who, who, who would that be? David. Yeah. David. Yeah. Okay. Who else should care to? Yes, Jim. As a young man in church, I had a pastor, his name was Don, and he helped me through a very rough period in my life personally, and it still sticks out in my mind as somebody who cared a lot for me. Wow, okay, a pastor. Who else? Who showed you care in your journey through life? Tom. I had a Sunday school teacher in, um, in Tampa, and he not only took, um, he and his wife became people that cared for my wife and myself and our children. And that was almost 30 years ago, and he's still in my life. Great. Some of you guys in the back, somebody who showed care to you. Church athletic director. Athletic director. Who else? I had a, I'm a retired cop, so the first post that I worked at, uh, post detective, his first statement to me was to ask me how old I was and told me he had more time carrying a badge than I had breathing. <laughs> and that was the only mean statement he ever made. He became my mom, but is what I called him. And he mentored me, uh, and so I left that post and he retired. Um, when I moved up into the UP, um, work wasn't that good, didn't have that kind of quality of people at that next post, but I took a walk to a mass, which is a retreat we have. And that 2004, from that point on, I had to ask him to go out That is incredible. Again, people touch our lives, and we can be forever changed. Somebody over here, who, who's impacted your life, showed care to you? Bill? The University Christian Fellowship Group at, Inter at Western Michigan University that I was not convicted of my sin, I was convinced of Jesus' love through them. Wow, okay. So care, uh, by way of those who care for us, actually changes us. In the same way as those who care for us, those that we care for can actually change them as well. And in our culture today, um, I, I found that we go through life at such a click that we don't always stop to care for others. And maybe we're moving so quick that we don't always stop to allow others to care for us. But the gospel paints a picture of what it means to be cared for and to care for others. And whether it's this setting or another setting, I honestly believe there's some people here that are a little skeptical in relationship to what I'm talking about. Maybe even to the point that you look like this dog, okay? How many of you know people that look like this dog? Anybody that knows? Yeah, some of you are raising your hands. You know, they look at you when you talk about Christianity with this skepticism, or even when you hear somebody speak about caring for others, you become a little bit skeptical. What does it really mean to care for others, to be cared for by others? A little bit of background um, to me. I I've spent 14 years with my wife and my kids traveling all over the country nine months out of the year, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in over 300 churches. This was my home for 14 years. Some of you look at it, you go, ooh, ah, must be nice. Those 14 years, my wife and I raised six kids, two dogs, living in that. Um, it, 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 you know, you can ooh and ah all you want, but that wears off after about the first 30 days of being on the road and the first four churches. We would go buy a house that was permanently built, and we'd go ooh and ah. That's what it looks like to be stationary. But as my wife and I traveled around the country with our family, one of the things that we were very concerned with was the click in which people lived life to the extent that they were failing to care for one another simply by show, slowing down, showing affection for others. The other day, um, I have some of my children that live in Louisville, Kentucky, and we were visiting them, 
and uh, we turned around and it was a quick trip back up and down and so uh, we stopped uh, in Indianapolis to grab a bite to eat there's a place that we like to go it's called Shapiro's Deli um, and it's a uh, 125 year old family delicatessen that's a Jewish delicatessen so me being a good Jew you know hey there's not many places you get good Jewish food we stopped there and uh, it was a cold day it, it was probably a negative 10 um, and we walked into the restaurant we ate something and we're sitting there and I'm observing a gentleman um, at a table by himself um, I, I gave notice to my family you know hey there's a guy um, you know we ought to be considerate of this individual. And um, let's just offer up a word of prayer. And I, I did that, we left, went to the bathroom, came back, um, and I saw that my wife had a styrofoam box there. And um, I said, what is it? She goes, well, it's a half a sandwich. I didn't finish eating it. I thought I'd give it to the gentleman. Can you take it over to him? And so I, I took the sandwich and I was walking over to him and I gave it to him and I asked him his name and what he was doing and I knew what he was doing. I mean, come on, it, it's freezing outside. It's obvious that he's in here. He's nursing a drink. You know that phrase, nursing a drink. Um, I grew up in the bar business, all right? I, my dad owned restaurants and bars and so uh, I was a bar back as a kid growing up. I saw a lot of people nurse the drinks at the bar, okay? He was just wasting time. He didn't want to go out into the cold. And I asked him his name, just like I went around the room and I asked you guys your names because names are important. I wanted to know that it was important. I said, hey, look, here's a clean half of a sandwich thought you might be hungry, would you like this? And he said, yes. I said, great, here you go. Before I backed away from him, the Holy Spirit began to convict me. Um, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you know him as Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit reigns inside you. And uh, he'll convict you from the inside out. And he was kind of tapping on me on the inside saying, why is he only worthy of a half a sandwich in a styrofoam container when he's created in my image? Don't you care about him? Ask him what he wants. And so I said, hey, this is going to sound kind of strange. I'm a Christian. Um, and, you know, I give this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Um, nothing in return. But I, I was convicted. Um, I ought to ask you, would you like something different or in addition to this? Uh, is there anything you want on the menu? I don't care what it is. Man, he was quick. Yeah, I want a chicken salad on whole wheat, lettuce and tomato, hold the mayo, um, and, you know, uh, can you add this to it? And I was like, yeah, man. And I went up to the counter, and I ordered it, and I served it to him, and I brought it, and, and I said, here you go. I don't know what has happened to that gentleman, but I know that in that moment I, I stopped and I, I responded in obedience to God to show care for someone. And um, all across the country, my wife and I and our family for 14 years are uh, endeavoring to inspire men and women, um, married couples, families, uh, to live in response to the gospel. To be, not simply do. I believe that one of the greatest means for us to impact culture today is by being, is by doing. And so I've been leading this family uh, to uh, endeavor to glorify God by caring for people. That's my wife of 30 plus years and our six children. We had two marriages uh, last summer. One son got married in May. One daughter got married in June. It was hectic. Um, and, and we had another wedding a couple of years prior to that. So three of our kids are married. Three are still single. But here's what I want to see them happen. I want them to live their lives in such a way that they slow down and they care for others. We live in a culture where um, many people are lonely. And, and recognize this, lonely is not a feeling that you're alone. Lonely is a feeling that no one cares. And, and I believe that could be said even in our homes today, where we can have children or nieces or nephews or grandkids um, or even parents that, that feel um, as though no one cares for them. The best place to be in caring for one another is in your own home. You become uh, an example to others of what it means to care well for one another. 
then they want what it is that you have in your home and you can take and export that to other people. So words are important. The scripture says to him who speaks, let him speak as it were the utterances of God. To him who serves, let him serve with the strength with which God supplies. So you've heard enough of my words. Um, I, I want us to look at the words of the scripture in relationship to caring for others. Um, several passages of scripture before I just go to the main text that I want to focus on. Philippians chapter 2 verse 4 says this, Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. That's a form of caring for others. Galatians 6.2 says, Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. That law that is being fulfilled is love. The scripture says that we are to love one another. How many of you ever found it's difficult to love people? It's great in theory, right? It's hard in practice. And some of those people that it could be difficult to love could be those that are closest to you. Um, I'm the youngest of three boys. Uh, my middle brother, his name was Scott. He passed away a number of years ago. Scott was um, epileptic and mildly retarded. Uh, Scott was very difficult to live with at times. Uh, the doctors had told my mom and dad he ought to be institutionalized. My mom and dad uh, did not do that and said, you know what, uh, we're going to endeavor to love him, even as lost people at this point in time. It's incredible how lost people can sometimes love people better than we who are followers of Jesus Christ. And um, I learned how to love a very difficult brother by my mom and dad who persevered in loving others. And uh, my mom and dad taught me how to carry the burden of my brother because, you know, although I was an epileptic and although I, I did not have learning difficulties to the point where I might be labeled as, we label some people as retarded, I learned what it was to do life with someone who was special needs and therefore love them. And actually, I learned how to love a community of special needs people. Sometimes we need to be the conduit of God's love. And when we're failing, then the question is, who is loving them? Romans 12.10 says this, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. This is this sense of caring. And so we've got to really heed to the scripture in relationship to what it looks like to love. Proverbs 21.13, he who shuts his ear to the cry of a poor will also cry himself and not be answered. I really hate to ponder that passage of scripture. But I wonder how many people I've passed that God has said, slow down, put your phone down. Quit being so enamored with that technology that you miss the opportunity to care well for another people. Quit being in such a hurry. Give ear, give eye. Give heart, give mind to those that you're coming in contact with. You don't recognize this. There may be that cry that comes from your own mouth that's going to be passed by one day. James 1.27 uh, reminds us the pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and our Father is this, to visit orphans, to, to care for widows that are in distress, to keep oneself unstained by the world. There's this urgency to care for others. Ephesians, be kind to one another. This tenderheartedness, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Again, uh, as my wife and I have um, been ministering across the country, we saw one of the things um, most evident within the Church of America today that is plaguing the church, and it's this thing called bitterness. Here's what bitterness is. Unresolved hurt. Someone has said something to you. Someone has failed to do something for you. Someone has done something to you. And whatever it was said or done or not done, you had an expectation. That expectation was not met. In the midst of it not being met, you became hurt. When you get hurt, you start to think about that hurt. That festering and thinking about that hurt is bitterness. And then when you see that person, you go the other way. 
You don't want to talk to that person. You don't want to communicate with that person or relate with that person. And, and we're telling people, come to the church. Be a part of the church. The lost people are coming into the church. They're coming with eyes wide open. And they're watching how relationships are playing out. And they're finding after a season of time, there's a lot of hurt, bitter people in the church that aren't caring for one another. Why do I want to be a part of this? And they back away from the church. Have you ever seen anything like that? In your own family? I've been party to where families have been together um, at family reunions, but inevitably they still seem as though they're separate. And you ask the question, why isn't so-and-so talking to so-and-so? Oh man, they got a grudge. What's that grudge? Bitterness. Unresolved hurt. How is it magnifying itself? failing to care for one another. In John chapter 13 verses 34 through 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you. That you also love one another. By this all men will know, and this is a key statement, that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another. This is Jesus. He, he is uh, stating, you know what? Be my disciple. Be an imitator of me. So my dad, again, um, he was a lost man. But there was somebody who took an interest in him. Who happened to be a believer in Jesus Christ. My dad was 50 years of age. Statistically speaking, it is harder to win somebody to become a follower of Jesus Christ when they're 50 and beyond than at any other stage of life. But because someone actually took an interest in my father by way of caring for him and decided to get to know him, not just look at him as another notch in the belt. He had an inroad into my dad's life. This man's name was Leonard, Leonard Rosenthal. So another fellow Jew to a Jew. The only difference about this Jew is that this Jew was a completed Jew. Hello? Completed Jew meaning he was a follower of Yeshua, who you know as Jesus, all right? He, he was a born again believer in Christ. And he loved Jesus. But you looked at this guy, uh, he was like the picture and the epitome of what a Jewish man would look like. Um, and, and, and my dad was able to connect with him. And, and so Martin began to meet with the, my dad and talk to my dad and, and, and share with my dad through his life. Every one of you has a unique life message. Trey, you've got people that you know that I will never know, that will never let me into their world, but Trey, they'll let you into their world. And you're that means to be able to share with them the love of God that I'll never have that opportunity. You are strategic, just like Leonard was to my dad. That care that Leonard showed resulted in my dad becoming a believer in Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, Leonard's wife, Marion, was showing care to my mom in a separate setting. On the same day, a thousand miles apart, my mom and dad prayed to receive Jesus Christ without either of them knowing it. <laughs> because the care of Leonard and because the care of Marion. It's cool how God can orchestrate things. There was no technology, so you couldn't FaceTime what was happening. You couldn't pick up the cell phone and call. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, my mom called my dad on you know, a, a regular landline, uh, was able to get a hold of him. He was in New Jersey in business. My mom was in Florida uh, with us kids and, and said, honey, I need to share something with you. And my dad said, no, I need to share something with you. Um, okay, you go first. Listen, I've surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. I believe he is the Messiah. <laughs> Let me tell you, you know Mary, uh, Leonard's wife, she's been sharing, I didn't want to tell you, but here's the fact, um, I too have surrendered my life to people caring. 
People who feel cared for, what they're able to do in light of caring for others can also make a change. And my mom and dad's life was used in a radical way to touch other people's lives with the gospel to where they were able to invite people to know Jesus as their savior. First John says this in chapter three, but whoever has the world's good, sees his brother in need, closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and in truth. The thing that I love about this passage of scripture is it's a call to action. We can wear the cross around our neck. We can wear the shirt with the logo. We can drive with the car with the fish. But the fact of the matter is, is that unless we're actually showing care for one another as Jesus showed care for us, we're going to miss the opportunity. Our words can fall short, but our actions can make a difference. And here's this call, man, to live differently caring for others. Colossians 3.12 says this, So, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. That there is this call that is given to every one of us to live in such a way where we're caring. So, key passage, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I've been a follower of um, Jesus Christ now for 37 years. Uh, my mid-teens is when I came to know Christ. You can do the math to try to figure out how, I, how old I am, all right? So I've done enough living to be able to be married 30 years with six kids. Um, the very first passage of scripture that I ever learned um, after my mom and dad got saved, by the way, um, Marion led my wife, my, led my mother to the Lord. Leonard led my dad to the Lord, showing care, compassion, kindness. Uh, their son, Martin Rosenthal, an upperclassman, showed care for me. And it was through Martin that I actually became a believer in Jesus Christ. Um, these men and women were conduits. So l- let's think about this illustration for a moment, conduit. Um, the projector that's on the ceiling that's hanging right over our heads. Uh, that is a conduit. It is taking the content from this commun- computer and through technology, it's routing it through that projector. That projector is projecting it on this screen. This projector is nothing more than a conduit. And I want to tell you about you. You're nothing more than a conduit. You got that picture? You're a vessel, a conduit. And God has uh, put you here as his children to project a message to a world that is potentially hopeless helpless and hurting. In your business, God wants you to project. In your vocation, God wants you to project. As a husband, God wants you to project. As a father, he wants you to project. As a, as a friend, he wants you to project. It could be as a coach. Now, we're all projecting. <coughs> question is, what is it? that we're projecting. As followers, we're to project his image, be imitators of him. The first verse that I ever learned was 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, behold, he is a new creation. All things are become new. There's this um, call to be different. Now, the reason why I share that is this past year, God's taken me back into this scripture and he's reminded me of something with a new set of lenses. And it was just in the following verses. It's something that I've read before, something that I've probably taught on before, but with a a renewed heart, God saying, I want you to take to heart this. And let's look at the scripture. If you don't have your Bible, it's behind me. Um, Beginning in verse 18, the scripture says this, God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. 
that God was reconciling the world to him in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though, I love this, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So I, I want to just break this passage down in the final moments that we have. And, and I want us just to look at what it means to be a conduit of God's love. First of all, we need to recognize that God gave us, according to this passage, a message and a ministry of reconciliation. Um, my dad, he grew up on the streets of Cleveland, Ohio, had no formal education. Uh, maybe went through fifth or sixth grade. My dad did a lot of things um, legal, but probably did many more things illegal, okay? Uh, it was involved in organized crime for a number of years. Um, I I've lived in seven states, um, 17 cities, and 38 different homes by the time I was 21 years of age. A lot of that was because my dad was on the run. Uh, when my dad became a new creation in Christ because someone cared enough to share with him the gospel and he was transformed, he had an audience of individuals that others could not reach, but he could. He was very intentional about sharing with them a message of reconciliation. Sometimes we go, well, I didn't go to seminary. Well, you know, I'm not theologically trained. Well, you know, I'm not a pastor. Well, hello. Since when are those the prerequisites for sharing with people the truth of God's word? God wants you and I to care enough for people to stop the busyness, to be able to say, hey, you know that God loves you? Maybe that's a foreign concept to you. Maybe you don't even know what that's like to be loved by God. But I just want to share something with you. God loves you, and he wants to have a relationship with you. You know what that message is right there that I just shared with you in that manner? A message of reconciliation. Telling people that they're loved and valued, and God wants to have a relationship with them. Second thing we can draw out of this passage is that he's committed to us the message of reconciliation that this is, should be our priority. Who's telling your grandkids about Jesus? It ought not be just the Sunday school teacher or the pastor. It ought to be you continuously reminding them. Who's telling your mate? Who's telling your co-workers? Thirdly, he's called us to be his representation by way of ambassador. And that's what you and I need to do. Now here's the thing that I've just been really um, processing this past year. That in my frailty, God wants to make his appeal through me to another. Is that not insane? Dr. Jeffrey, I've known you for years. You've taken care of my eyes. Um, I think about the audience that you have. I think about the way that you're able to care for people and, and be able to help them. And, and it's incredible that you have this, this giftedness that I'll never have. But your ministry is so much more than just helping people see. God's wanting to make his appeal through you to them about the message of reconciliation and the ministry of reconciliation. Do you see how we play a part in this? You're his ambassador and he's making his appeal through you. That's why it's important that we learn how to care for people well. 
we can obliterate the whole concept of a loving God by poorly caring for people. And, and we need to be God's tool, recognizing with sobriety that if we're going to be, not just take something home to do, we have got to be aware of the fact that we're God's conduit. And our appeal should be this. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled. People who care for people share this message over a sandwich. Maybe with somebody that you don't even know. I come on behalf of Jesus Christ. I share a sandwich with you. You're of value. close with this thought. When, when someone truly cares about you, they make an effort and not an excuse. <laughs> and my fear is, is in our churches, we've been making a lot of excuses as to why we don't care. We need to slow down. We need to stop. We need to begin with the people that we're closest with and show them that we care, and then move out from there. As we present to them this incredible love of Jesus Christ, and he makes his appeal through us. So why do we gather? Um, honestly, we gather uh, to inspire you as men um, this day, uh, to take a step in this journey. Again, 37 years I've been on the journey. Um, I'd like to say that the trajectory has been upward. I believe that it has. But there have also been those seasons on this upward tra trajectory that I've flatlined, I've uh, backstepped, I've dropped down, uh, I've been challenged and inspired to take it up a notch. And that's really our journey. I want to inspire you to recognize that you are God's conduit. Care well for people. So we're going to dismiss in a moment. Um, if, if you have something to write on, I want to ask you to do one thing for me. I want, you to a I want to ask you to write the name of someone that you know that might be in your shadow. You know, they, 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 they're lurking behind you. They're watching you. You don't know them well, but you know that they're there watching you. Maybe it's a teenager. Maybe it's a peer. Maybe it's somebody older. They're not followers of Jesus Christ to the best of your knowledge. Can you come up with a name? I'm going to give you a moment to come up with that name. By the way, if you can't come up with that name, um, that's a problem in and of itself, and we need to have a session on that. Um, but come up with a name here for a moment, okay? Take and think about that. Write that name down. Now, as you have that name, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Care enough about that person to show them that they're of value. Allow God to use you as he makes his appeal to that person. Wanting to reconcile that person unto himself. That means make yourself vulnerable. Make yourself available. Make yourself move in such a direction that you're in that person's space and show them you care. If we did that, guess what? There wouldn't be enough chairs in this room to hold all the people when you come back by way of bringing them back with you. There just wouldn't be. Our churches would actually exponentially grow in showing people that we care. And it's not about growing the church. It's about bringing people into the community, God's community. It's about restoring a relationship, reconciliation. You love guys. Thank you for being here. Let's pray together. Can we do that? Let's just bow our heads. Father, um, help us bring this truth um, to a place where we can wrap our minds and our hearts uh, in our physical being around this to where we're called to action. Help us care 
for others. Thank you for um, allowing us to be cared by others. I thank you for a Leonard Rosenthal and a Marion Rosenthal and a Martin Rosenthal that cared enough uh, to be used of you to bring my family into this community called the Community of Believers. I, I pray, Lord, that, that you would, by your Spirit, empower these men to make a difference for your glory. And I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.